Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's having a very good day at the symposium, the second day of the symposium. Um, I didn't actually realise that Adelaide was 30 minutes um, behind Sydney, so I did log on at three in Sydney, actually. Um, so I'll get started. Um, so before we begin in the spirit of reconciliation, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands at UCS. And also like to pay respect to the elders, both past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for these places and wherever you are joining us from today across Australia. For a little bit of introduction, I'll sort of give a brief rundown about me. Um, my name's Kurt, obviously. Um, I'm currently a third year law and communication student here at UCS in Sydney. And by virtue of my role on the university's academic board, um, I was asked to join SVA. Um, and by that, I sort of um, wanted to present a bit of a bit about a, sort of what I've been doing at UCS. And I'm also a number of, on a number of other committees, including misconduct, um, which is also under governance, and at a society level, I'm vice president for our law society. In terms of some exciting projects I've done in two years um, in my leadership roles at the university, last year I worked on embedding Indigenous graduate attributes. Um, this looked at how do we um, improve the embedment of cultural competency across our curriculum, um, followed by some Indigenous um, representation reforms, which I actually did in the past three months, where we added an Indigenous student onto academic board, which took about three months of governance and policy changes, and it was officially voted on unanimously by academic board last Wednesday. Um, followed by next month after exams, I'll be working on academic integrity in a COVID-19 landscape, how do we ensure academic integrity um, when we have, for example, online exams as opposed to physical? And the one bolded is the one I'll be presenting on today, which is a plan that I've been working on since March last year. So about 14, 15 months now, um, and it'll be a continued plan over the next two years. And I guess for a bit of context, I'll probably just go through a little bit very briefly. Um, UCS has 45,000 students, 4,000 staff, we're a very, very young university. Um, we're only established in 1988, um, so we're only 33 years old. And we're currently ninth in, ninth in Australia and 133rd in the world. Um, and we're first in Australia for universities under 50 years old. Um, we also have 210,000 plus alumni living across 140 countries. Let's get started. A bit of a run through about what today is gonna look like. I'll go through a bit about the background um, of the plan. Um, and a simple layout of what governance sort of looks like at UCS, which I'm sure your institutions would look very similar. Um, and then I'll go through issues. Um, this will sort of be quite brief. I think the reason why we're all here today and part of this symposium is that we know there are issues with student governance and um, um, student participation governance rather. Um, and we will primarily focus on the recommendations. Um, that'll be the crux of this presentation. How do we fix it? Um, how do we take these issues that, for example, I've, I've identified at UCS, uh, but also do many other institutions, but how do we actually fix it? And how do we implement these recommendations? And then I'll wrap up by concluding um, on the end goals of what this whole plan's about. And there'll be an opportunity for Q&A at the end as well. So for a bit of background, um, the Student Leadership Plan Students as Partners um, plan was devised over 12 months with 75 individual consultations in 2020. Um, the plan identifies issues with a lack of student participation in university governance and it aims to address this with nine recommendations. Um, when I started the plan in about March last year, it came about because after three months in my first year on academic board, I realised that no one was actually motivated to get involved. Um, quite a lot of my student colleagues were actually, at the time, uh, we only had four out of nine um, because the five remained, remainder, so remaining, um, had to be nominated because no one went in the election. So they were waiting for someone to be picked by a staff member. So I thought, how do we fix this? So over the course of 2020 last year, I started planning, started consulting, I see Elisa Percy is also with us today, who's from UCS. Um, so I've consulted her as well out of the 75. Um, and subsequently in December last year, um, I handed down a report as well as a plan to the Deputy Vice Chancellor um, for education and students with the support of other key university departments, including governance, um, on how do we 
actually implement this. Um, and originally I thought it would be fairly easy, uh, but when it comes to implementation, it came, came to a quick reality check that it does take time. So we've decided it'll be two years over this year and 2022. Currently the plan to use yes is up to um, the second recommendation out of 12 and it's progressing very well. Um, recommendations are grouped into short, medium and long-term goals over two years. So for a bit of background, just at a glance about the structure of governance to UCS, I'm sure this is very, very similar with many other institutions you're um, joining us from today. Um, so essentially at council, which is essentially the university council or the senate, um, at other universities you might call it the senate, and of course you would have academic board um, or academic senate, um, however, however you wish to call it, um, and then you have a number of committees under that. And you have faculty boards that govern each individual faculty, school or division, um, and then committees of faculty board. So the blue icons in the blue box um, is the university governance roles. And the ones in gray um, are the external bodies. Um, so there's essentially three prongs of student leadership at our university. Um, you have governance, which is the blue ones, the main ones, the boards, the committees, and on either side of it, you have um, the SRC, which I'm sure um, many students who are joining us today from your institutions, you might be from your SRC, but also we have what's called Activate UCS, which is our on-campus service provider. Um, so th this is the organization that runs all the clubs and societies, all the fun things, I guess. Um, and many people at the end of the day just get very confused about these three prongs. So, the next slide, you'll notice there'll be a slight change and it's grayed out. Uh, based on percentage, compared to the last slide, there are 52 former student leadership positions and at use, yes, in the last five years, uh, more than half of the formal leadership and governance positions on boards and committees, uh, more than half uh, remained uh, vacant after elections. And this goes usually um, if a single person puts their name up for the role, they automatically get it. Um, if no one goes to the role, then over a few months in the following year, um, a staff member just chooses someone to fill the position. But you need to meet quorum, you need to meet requirements, and you choose someone. So that's just for a bit of background and context um, about the plan and what it looks like at UCS, which I'm sure is very similar to your institution as well. So now the more important part, the issues. Um, the plan identified six issues, um, and, for the, and for all intents and purposes, this whole presentation um, is a more simplified version. Um, it allows you to take it back to your institution and um, actually have a look um, and actually apply it to your institution because um, the actual plan at UCS is very UCS-centric, um, so I've diluted a little bit for the purposes of this presentation. So the first one is confusion. Um, which I'm sure is very analogous with many, uh, you know, many other universities. There is a general confusion about the term student leadership. We throw it around everywhere. It's a term people use to get students to come to our university. Um, it's a term people use to get involved. It's a term that student societies use to get people to come to events. Um, so it's just a lot of confusion. How do you distinguish bodies such as Activate, which is your on-campus society provider, and the Student Association, which is the SRC, but also 52 formal board and governance committee positions. It's very, very hard. And it doesn't help when the elections all happen in the same week, which happens at our university. So you're asking students to vote in so many different things in the one week for three different things that have hundreds of different positions in them. Um, it's quite confusing, obviously. But it also comes down to university-wide awareness. It comes down to culture. Um, so awareness of elections and misconceptions about the three different representative bodies need to be addressed. But how do you actually do this? Um, culture is a very hard thing to change at universities. Um, obviously, um, from obviously I mostly just know about New South Wales universities, but um, we we're only, for example, you know, we're only thirty three years old. We're not university. We're, sorry, we're not the University of Sydney or. University of New South Wales have been around for well over 100 years and have a very strong, I guess, student um, activism culture, a very strong student pol political culture as well, um, and a very strong culture on election time. Um, so how do you change that? Um, and how do you actually address it? It's one of the key issues we'll focus on. 
And now we move on to the student experience. So congratulations, you've won a position, you've been nominated, you're officially on a board or a committee, but what's the actual student experience on there? Um, so the experience of an elected student leader um, is quite often based on consultation is quite uh, mundane. I mean, you have a lot of dead time in between meetings. You might have a meeting every two months, uh, but what happens in between these meetings? Or for example, you get into the position in January, but your first meeting isn't until March. About three months is already sort of eaten out of your one year term. Um, in that three months, you could have done a lot. And that means you probably have about nine months remaining. Um, and most meetings happen in between the semesters of so six months. So technically your term is one year, but the actual work that you're engaged in is probably six months. How do you maximize the amount of time um, and cater to the student experience when they're on these positions? The fourth one is limited direction. Once you're in the role, uh, once you're actually in the role and doing stuff, um, how do you sort of scope out what are you actually meant to do? Um, what happens if a student comes to you with issues? Um, who do you actually contact if there's an issue? Who is actually, who do I actually report to technically? You know, I might be on the academic board, but is there a person that I can go to specifically um, if I have a particular issue? Um, or if I need an issue raised or requires attention, is there actually a particular person that I sort of have to speak to? Um, or give, you know, if I was in a role that's quite new, I'd like some direction. Um, if you're in the role, but you seem to be kind of really contact anyone. Um, and I'll now go to the networks and opportunities. Um, so by virtue of a person's position, um, student leaders have the opportunity to capitalize on the opportunity to meet staff, work on projects and be invited to contribute in other ways. For example, me coming on to SVA is um, by virtue of our DVC asking me to get involved. Um, and I'll finish off with handover and recognition. There are no formal processes for handing over the role to an incumbent, um, nor is there tangled recognition for a student leader's participation. Um, you want recognition. I know, you know, credit isn't everything, but you'd like something to recognise that you did something and you spent a whole year during a university degree. So now go to how do we fix this? Confusion and awareness. Firstly, it's a website. So we recently we went through a whole redesign of our UCS website to include the names and headshots of the top 12 student leaders. Obviously not feasible to include all 52 or every single student representative. So we included the 10 on the, uh, the governance roles of the boards and committees on council and academic board, one on Activate UCS and one from the student association. The election frequently asked questions information will soon be rewritten by student leaders um, from a student perspective. But at the moment, uh, when you read it from, I guess, um, when we read it from, I guess, our perspective, you can tell the staff member wrote it. Um, you know, no one knows what, you know, what electorate are you in or what constituency are you in, that you can only represent constituencies in law. Very, very complex information at the moment on our website. So over the summer break, uh, the winter break, sorry, coming up, I'll be working on rewriting this as a whole. But it's also coming down to social media. We all know how powerful social media can be. Um, it is a great medium for us to broadcast the messages of student reps. Uh, but of course, keeping in line with the, I guess, mantra of the university or the tone of voice of the university, um, that quite often needs to be screened and ensured, you know, it's consistent with branding and whatnot. Um, so sharing key achievements um, or if anything really big happens, um, student leaders have the opportunity um, to share that with people. Um, so what does this actually look like? So this slide will now show us a little bit about um, what we've been doing at UCS in the last two months with the planned implementation. So our website has recently went through the redesign. Um, so the marketing team did a photo shoot of all the 12 student reps, um, as you can see to your left, as well as the uh, position, headshot, a brief bio, um, and an email contact option to contact your respective student leader. Um, based on statistics, this website has had high amount of traffic since its launch about three weeks ago. And I realized I've gotten um, a little bit more emails than I ordinarily would get um, before the website launch. So it does seem to be working, but there'll be formal, I guess, reflection later down the track this year. But on the topic of social media um, and sharing achievements, this is sort of what it looks like. 
Um, these are photos only from, from last three months. They're only photos of me, so I hope that doesn't seem too indulgent. I couldn't be bothered to ask for permission from the other student reps to get their photos. Um, but these are photos of uh, me and a few of my student colleagues meeting with the senior executive to discuss a whole host of things. Um, and they will be shared over social media. Um, the one to your far right was last Wednesday when we passed historic um, reforms at academic board to introduce an Indigenous student member who is in the middle there. Um, and that was with Professor Mark McDaniel, who many of you might know from your institutions as well. Um, and that is usually shared on the university's social media in the coming weeks. So now I'll move on to the student experience and limited direction. How do you fix this? Firstly, an induction. Um, student leaders will receive a tailored induction guide um, that details, for example, how to raise issues, key staff to know, meeting protocol, and who's who. Um, the potential for an induction guide um, is not limited to those four options. Um, many different institutions would have different ways for a student to approach things, um, but our induction guide will focus on those key items. Meetings. Student leaders will have the opportunity to meet with the relevant staff. They always have the right to meet with relevant staff. Um, for example, student leaders and academic board will meet periodically with the DVC education students, followed by the dean or associate dean from their respective faculty or school that represents, um, which we did in the past few months. Um, it came to a shock and surprise when I spoke with my student colleagues at other universities um, around our area as well here in Sydney, um, but their dean or associate dean refused to meet with the student leader, um, often saying we don't have time or um, they just don't have time, usually is the answer. And no one's that busy to not meet for 15 minutes just to know the student who will be working with you for the next year, who is sitting next to you at meetings for the next year. But consultation, it's really important that our student leaders were connected with key parts of the university when it comes to consultation. Um, so before raising issues formally, we should have the option to go to someone. So for example, an executive officer for that relevant committee and be like, hey, I'd like to raise this issue. Should I raise it formally or should I get some consultation beforehand? So for example, last year, uh, me and my student colleagues obviously jumped the gun a little bit, but when we moved to online learning, um, we had a bit of recommendations, how we can improve it, such as the consistency of the length of Zoom sessions and all subjects being regulated. Some subjects had none, some had three hours, etc. cetera. Um, and we were told that we weren't really told anything, so we formally raised it. It was addressed immediately at the meeting because it's almost wrong to not offer Zoom sessions in the subjects during COVID last year. But we perhaps could have consulted with the relevant department um, or even um, the Institute for Interactive Media and Learning, uh, which could have assisted. So it's things like that, uh, having the ability to, cons to consult before formally raising issues. Now I move on to networks and opportunities. Um, so networking. At the moment, we've hosted two. Um, so networking morning and afternoon teas are hosted where all student reps and leaders across university, including governance, including Activate and the SRC are invited. Um, it doesn't matter you know, where you're from, um, all student leaders in any leadership role are invited. And this is an opportunity to speak informally with senior leaders to meet other staff as well, who also sit on the respective committee that you're on. Um, outside of formal business. Um, but we find when you meet staff, even before and after a formal meeting, you might get 10 minutes to chat before and after, um, but it doesn't really go towards its purpose. Um, so it's a purpose, um, I guess, planned networking opportunity for the students, which we've done twice now, which works quite well. But a handover document is really important. Um, but when I first got into the role in 2020, I couldn't get in touch with the 2019 student rep for law um, on academic board because they graduated and I couldn't find them on social media either. So there should be a formal document where you have a continuity of student leadership. Um, I do know there is another session going on at the moment which talks about continuity of student leadership um, when a student finishes up their term. How do you hand it over to the next person? So there's a few questions there which I'll um, let you to read. Um, you know. It's just simple, it could be a one page A4 document which the student rep completes at the end of their term. We, you can talk about how you found your time on that committee this year and you know, any final tips you'd like to give your successor. And the last one is a thank you from the Vice Chancellor. Um, 
recognition. Last year, at the request of uh, myself and a few student colleagues who were on the board, um, I guess previously, we thought we don't have an end of year thank you event, which they usually do because of COVID. Um, what if the Vice Chancellor sent out a letter to every student to thank them? Um, it doesn't have to be personalised every single letter, but um, obviously something addressed to the student would be nice and every student leader received one. Um, and it's that sort of recognition that came to a surprise to many of my other colleagues when we received it. Um, and that's now become a recommendation as part of the plan, but also a certificate. Um, it's not, it's at the end of the day, it's two pieces of paper, but it's two pieces of paper that provides tangible recognition um, and a student can actually, um, you know, have it as a keepsake. Um, and I'm not saying employees will ask, you know, show me proof that you were on X board for this year. Um, but it's good to have that element of recognition because before this, it's almost like 31st of December finishes it up. Thank you for your time. And the next person comes in on the 1st of January for another year. Um, it's a, there was no sort of continuity or recognition or sort of a transition at all. So now I'll wrap up. So at a glance, we talked about confusion. We talked about university-wide awareness. Then we talked about the student experience the limited direction and networks and opportunities and hand of recognition. And that results in these 12 recommendations. Um, these four recommendations are now going to be implemented over two years, different ways of implementation. I didn't go into detail about implementation at your particular institution um, because we would all approach it in different ways. So I'll wrap up by what will all this actually do. So these 12 recommendations will over time foster a university culture of students truly students as partners where senior leaders work closely with students increase the participation of students in governance roles to achieve authentic representation choosing a student to simply fill a role is not authentic representation in my opinion at least reduce the ministry burden of university staff reaching out to nominate students that goes towards my previous point um, it takes a lot of time to reach out to 30 staff and ask those staff to choose a student and hopefully the student accepts that offer. Um, develop lasting skills and networks during student leaders time at university. I would say in my almost one year and a half on academic board now, the amount of staff that I've met um, from the vice chancellor to the deputy vice chancellor, all the way down to security and cleaning staff that are always um, you know, in the area that I'm working in, um, in one of the rooms I'm in now as well is incredible. Um, they're people that you'll keep in touch with and even staff, um, academic staff, professional staff, who will know you and you'll be connected with them well after your one year on a relevant committee. And the last one is create the foundations for students to actually contribute to decisions that affect them. That's the crux of student leadership and that's the crux of student representation. You want feedback on things, on the very things um, that affect them directly. Um, in terms of um, overall for Q&A, I believe it's the next slide. And that's pretty much it. I noticed there is one question um, in the chat and that is from Fiona. Um, do you have formal recognition at Hakes as well? Um, yes, we do. Um, but the point towards recognition is it doesn't provide intangible recognition until the student graduates, but our AHAGS doesn't come out until you officially are graduated. Um, so we don't see our AHAGS until we get our testimony and we're officially graduated. So yes, it provides a degree of recognition there, um, but nothing that you get, you know, if I finish my term um, today, I don't see it on my AHAGS until I graduate in 2023. Um, so it's that sort of element of recognition as well. Um, we only have time for about one or two questions, um, but does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute or pop it in the chat. Kurt, if you can just um, um, share your screen there, I'm just gonna pop up the, um, the names of the, session, the other sessions so that people can start thinking about where they wanna go next as well, whilst the questions sure. are happening. Sounds good. Just talk. So 
just to be clear, this is the, the next sessions that are starting about now. So um, we'll just take these questions and then I'll pop the links to these um, for, for rooms two and three into the chat if you want to leave and join a different um, session. Thanks, Kurt, back to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, thanks for your comment, Sonia. Um, a lot of work into this sort of plan, um, but very glad it's been implemented. And it, it, I think it's the openness of the university staff um, to embrace the plan, um, overwhelming support from the Deputy Vice Chancellor to um, expedite the implementation as well, which is incredible. Um, Colleen, do you have recognition for all peer leaders, past peer advisors? Um, we do have peer networking, which I think is what you're referring to. Um, they actually do. So the recommendation of the letter from the Vice Chancellor and a certificate was actually copied from our peer leaders who are volunteer people um, that transition um, first year students during orientation at the university. So these are volunteers um, and we actually copied the exact same recommendation. We thought, um, you know, at the end of the day, even committee members on boards are volunteers, so they should get perhaps the same recognition. Hi, it's Sally, not Sheila. No, um, no. I was just writing to congratulate you, Kurt, on the presentation, and I have been, I was overwhelmed at the um, progress that's been made. At, as you know, I'm an ex um, chair of academic board and council member at UTS. Mm -hmm. and um, it actually hosted, UTS hosted Student Voice Australia. I mean, I was there and it's so exciting to see the progress that you've made and I really enjoyed your presentation. And if you could congratulate Shirley Alexander as well for me, that would be great. Absolutely. I look, well, forward, mm -hmm. I look forward to hearing more. Fantastic. So, so Extraordinary. Thank you very much, Alicia. I couldn't have done it without your support and many, many chats throughout the year. Fantastic. Well, I think that wraps up my session for the symposium. Um, thank you all for joining and listening. I hope you can take back some of the ideas and recommendations back to your institution. And hopefully we can reconvene um, at the next symposium or any other opportunity we may cross paths. On that, I hand it back to Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. So impressive. Um, so if you are staying with us, um, our next presenter is Nira Rahman with Campbell Ryder and Wajiha Aisha um, and from the University of Melbourne. I think they're with us.